This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. I'm David Hill. I'm the librarian at the ANS, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our 94th long table and introduce our presenters today. Uh, most, if not all of you, will know Len Augsburger, a prominent figure in numismatic circles, and particularly in the area of numismatic research and uh, literature. A fellow of the American Numismatic Society and has written widely in the field of American numismatics. Uh, a book that he co-authored entitled 1792, Birth of the Nation's Coinage, was received, has received the Numismatic Literary Guild Book of the Year Award in 2017. And for years, Len has served as the project coordinator for the Newman Numismatic Portal, which is based in Washington University in St. Louis and is funded by the Eric P. Newman Numismatic Education Society. In 2015, the Newman Portal partnered with the ANS and set up a satellite operation on site here to scan uh, the library's rarities as well as the ANS's unique archival collections. And here I wanna emphasize in particular that the Newman Society has gone well beyond simply scanning and making these materials available online from the ANS. Uh, and this is something that would have been difficult, very difficult for us to accomplish on our own, if not impossible. Uh, but it has also um, funded the preparation of these materials for scanning and uh, the scanning that is currently done on site by Lara Jacobs. And this has resulted in vast improvements to our collections, including in the arrangement and physical housing of the materials and uh, improvements just in the, um, our understanding of our archival holdings. So we're very appreciative to the Newman project for that. Uh, in addition, we're extremely grateful for just outright grant funding that we have gotten through the Newman Society. Uh, today, Len is joined uh, by Kim Dumas, who is the library technical assistant for the Newman Numismatic Portal at Washington University. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenters. All right, thank you, David. We'll get the slides up here. All right, well, let's uh, jump in here. So uh, Eric P. Newman, uh, longtime St. Louis attorney, uh, recently passed away at the uh, advanced age of 106, and uh, ANS board member for many years, uh, researched and wrote widely within the area of American numismatics. First published with uh, ANS in uh, 1956 and uh, started the Eric P. Newman Numismatic Education Society. Uh, which today funds uh, the Newman Numismatic Portal and uh, other initiatives. In 1970, he was the angel for uh, an important collection of Islamic coinage that came into the cabinet here. And he was on uh, the, the council until about 2000 and uh, among other things uh, served as the point for the uh, recovery of the uh, uh, Clap Large Scent Collection. All right, next slide. Okay, so uh, Newman Portal was launched in 2014 uh, with the charter of uh, making literature and images of numismatics uh, available uh, on a free and forever basis. So uh, today you can be anywhere in the world and if you have an inter internet connection, you can look at plated Chapman catalogs or uh, uh, many other resources. Okay, so the, uh, to, to give some idea of the, the organization of the project, uh, the site itself went live in 2016. Uh, it is funded by uh, the Newman Numismatic Education Society, which uh, we refer to as EPNIS. And uh, EPNIS has been a longtime supporter of uh, the ANS uh, Graduate Seminar, uh, also funds uh, the ANA Summer Seminar, 
and uh, for many years had uh, a presence uh, as a money museum in St. Louis. Uh, the Newman family itself uh, has uh, other uh, uh, charitable foundations, and uh, this one is uh, strictly focused on numismatics. The Newman portal project itself is administered by Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, the Newman family has longstanding relationship with the university. Uh, Eric himself was a graduate of the law school. And his son, uh, Andy Newman, is currently chairman of the Board of Trustees of the university. And they've uh, funded several capital projects on campus, uh, including the Newman Tower, the Edison Theater, the uh, uh, Newman Training Center on the medical campus. And there are two uh, employees within the university, uh, within the library, uh, myself and Kim Dumas, who is uh, with me here today. Uh, and we are uh, fully allocated to the Newman Portal project uh, under the organization of uh, Olin Library. Okay, so what is NNP? Uh, it's a searchable online repository of uh, documents, images, related databases. We have a strong collection of auction sale catalogs. We've scanned over 10,000 uh, such items. Many uh, American numismatic and other uh, world periodicals. We have uh, multimedia. Uh, among the video, we have the uh, David Lizzo video collection that goes back to the 1980s. Uh, features just about uh, anyone who's ever spoken at a at a, a coin show during that period. And we have image collections, uh, and we're starting to do and have done a lot of work in the archival space at, at the National Archives, uh, the uh, Eric P. Newman papers, and uh, here at the ANS, which we'll get more into as we go on. Most of this content is unique to us. It's not something that uh, Google Books did uh, when they uh, backed up their trucks to the large university libraries and scanned, for example, everything at the University of Michigan or Harvard. Um, these places don't have the specialty numismatic publications that you'll find at the uh, American Numismatic Society and in other important numismatic libraries. And then uh, additionally, uh, Newman Portal is really a community resource. Uh, we've had over 150 organizations who have loaned us material, who have uh, given us rights to scan their material and uh, to share this with everyone in the numismatic community. So it's really, uh, kind of this uh, this center point where uh, everyone can gather around and uh, contribute to. And then we do actual scanning work at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, we're set up here at the ANS, and then we also do work within the National Archives. Okay, so what NNP is not, it's not a peer-reviewed academic journal. Uh, there are plenty of those. Uh, plenty of good ones and uh, you have to use the same uh, level of critical thought that you would with a physical library so that really doesn't change it's the same um, and then uh, we're not a substitute for a physical library either I think uh, there's something very important uh, about printed uh, copies that we need to preserve Printed copies are, are really the standard for long-term archival preservation. Uh, you go back several hundred years and, you know, what is it? It's prints. That's what's endured. So, um, you know, we need to preserve that. Um, and I think of Newman Portal more as a, a complement or an enhancement or, ex, or an extension to uh, a physical library. Uh, the computer, the internet are fabulous for finding needles and haystacks and for search. Uh, but uh, in, in terms of what enables uh, scholarship, I think uh, just having the tangible physical copies is something that, that's still important. Okay, so let's talk about the NNP work at ANS. Um, so the scanning here is uh, done by uh, Internet Archive under the sponsorship of uh, Newman Numismatic Portal. And uh, Internet Archive is a large digital, digital repository of several million books. Uh, they do their own scanning as well as uh, 
uh, have partner organizations such as Newman Portal that uh, uses them as a repository. And then uh, Internet Archive uh, uh, associate Laura Jacobs and uh, previously John Grafeo uh, do the uh, scanning work here at ANS uh, with the uh, assistance of the librarian David Hill. As of last week, when we put the slide together, we had done over 12,000 documents, and we'll uh, jump into some of the things that we've digitized here. And uh, one thing I really like about this, uh, we've been able to link all of the scanning work that we've done here to the ANS library catalog. So uh, people who are used to using the library catalog, uh, they can continue to do so, and a lot of times there will be links to the actual items. So you don't have to call up David and get a copy or come to New York. You just click and there it is. So um, I, that, that's one of the things I've been uh, really proud of that we've been able to make happen here at ANS. Okay, so the first series we scanned at ANS were the uh, bound American auction sale catalogs. Uh, several hundred volumes containing uh, 19th century American auction sale catalogs. The first item we did was uh, Kogan sale of the Graz collection in May of uh, 1859. And very typical collection, American collection for the period, uh, uh, early copper coins, colonials. Uh, uh, people were starting to collect runs of proof sets even at that point in time. And uh, We've used the uh, John Adams bibliography of uh, US numismatic literature for the auction sale catalogs. And uh, Adams volume one lists about, I believe, uh, 1,100 items, of which we've uh, captured 97% of them. OK. Um, one of the things we scanned early on at ANS were the Virgil Brand ledgers. So he. Uh, founded the Brand Brewing Company in Chicago and uh, inventoried his collection in this massive set of, of 32 ledgers. And the uh, image there doesn't really quite capture uh, the, 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 the grand nature of these things. Um, but in any case, uh, there are over 100,000 numbered items in this set of ledgers. And uh, the collection itself was broken up uh, over many years, but the ledgers uh, came to the ANS in 1991 uh, from heirs of the estate. And they're all oversized. So these were actually scanned off site uh, at an Internet Archive Center in Princeton. And uh, uh, notably because the, the scanning equipment that we have set up here doesn't do large format documents. So um, this was uh, a particular resource that uh, I know David got a ton of requests for, and now we've uh, been able to make those online. So this is just what a sample page looks like. Uh, this particular page lists uh, some Mexican medals from the brand collection. Um, we're actually only seeing half of it because there's another, uh, this would be the, the left page of the ledger and then the right page will have some uh, accession information in terms of where the items came from. So uh, as a result, now that people have access to these offline, um, they've started to build indexes for them. And uh, so Saul, Saul Teichman has uh, indexed a lot of the significant US coins listed in the brand ledgers. Uh, we've had people uh, look at uh, merchant counter stamps from the UK, pit farthings, and uh, this is work that you know really probably couldn't have happened unless they had offline access to these because it's um, it, it, it's sometimes difficult to get into New York and uh, visit the library here, especially if you don't live in the area. Um, so one one thing Saul already did, he corrected a pedigree. Um, of uh, the 1792 Washington President gold piece uh, using using this resource. And uh, again, there, there's a lot more information there. Okay, uh, we've also worked with the NorWeb collection archives at ANS. This was a multi-generational collection uh, sold by uh, uh, Bowers and Morena in the late 80s. Uh, there are five ledgers 
in the archives uh, with items numbered from uh, one up to 17,000. And these came uh, via Henry Norweb, who was the president of ANS in uh, 1992. Uh, additionally, in the Norweb archives are index card inventories uh, for uh, some Canadian material. And then we have these uh, wonderful uh, coin rubbings that uh, Emery made, Norweb did um, when she was young. And you can see, um, you know, she's uh, identifying uh, die marriages. And uh, some of these, not this one, um, will even show some of these coins uh, rotated, which is uh, uh, a nice observation uh, to be making as, as a young numismatist. You uh, realize that uh, one of the dies is rotated and uh, depicted accordingly. All right, and these are uh, just some typical entries from the uh, Norweb collection, uh, some early entries uh, from 1937. I think um, the ledger was obviously started uh, uh, later than the collection itself, but uh, this is uh, what was captured at that time. And uh, it's got accession information in it and uh, descriptions of pieces as well. All right, another resource we've uh, worked with here are the New Netherlands Company Archives. Uh, this New York firm had about 100 sales between uh, 1940 and 1977, and the archives came in uh, via George Colby in 1992, uh, sponsored by uh, Tony Terranova, Harry Bass, Joe Lasser, and Don Partrick, and uh, includes bid books, invoices, correspondence, inventories, and uh, other items dated uh, for duration of the life of the firm. And here's just a sample from New Netherlands. It's an invoice uh, from their uh, 11th sale in 1943 to the uh, New Jersey researcher Damon Douglas, who was buying uh, a couple volumes of uh, numismatic notes and monographs. Um, I haven't spoken with a lot of researchers who have used this New Netherlands material. It could be they don't know it's out there yet, but I suspect there's a lot of uh, really rich information in there um, once people start digging into it further, um, especially in terms of, you know, pedigree, um, you know, with the bid books, uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, good stuff in there. All right, another group we've worked with at ANS are Charles Barber Papers. Uh, he was U.S. Mint Chief Engraver for many years. Uh, the uh, original archives came in uh, via stacks from the family. Uh, they donated the originals to the Smithsonian, but they uh, deposited uh, copies in several libraries. And uh, we had a researcher contacted me, wanted to do, get some information out of the Barber Papers, and uh, so we had them uh, scanned here at ANS. And uh, this is just a listing of uh, some of the material in the Barber papers. Um, we've got uh, inventory of coins that he owned, um, the uh, die record book from the US Mint uh, was in there, and then uh, correspondence relating to coin production that the United States did for uh, a number of other countries uh, around the turn of the century. And then uh, some other miscellaneous correspondence uh, is in there as well. So this is just an example. This is the die record book uh, from 1884 for uh, United States proof coinage. Um, this one, uh, interestingly, uh, lists the 1884 trade dollar, which was previously thought of as uh, a surreptitious issue, but now uh, that we see the die record here officially, uh, there's more reason to think that that coin is in, in fact a legitimate issue of the mint. Okay, uh, moving on to the uh, Chapman papers, and uh, just a heads up to David, uh, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about this in a minute. So, um, so I'll turn your microphone on. Um, so these were uh, Philadelphia coin dealers, uh, number of auction sales until 1906. Uh, they split up in 1906 for reasons unknown. This is one of these 
classic American numismatic questions that hasn't been answered, you know, like, you know, uh, where were the continental dollars struck? Uh, why did the Chapman brothers break, break up? We don't know. But in any case, uh, they both uh, continued in, in the business until the 1930s. And uh, the ANS uh, got a lot of their archival material from uh, the estate of, of the family. And uh, there's some wonderful information in here, uh, including some of their uh, early business correspondence, uh, press copy books of letters sent uh, from the 1880s, uh, Henry Chapman's list of bad customers. So, and then here, here's an example of some of the business correspondence. And uh, if you read through, you get these wonderful collector stories, but um, this one comes from uh, uh, Mrs. Catherine B. Wetmore of New Jersey. Uh, uh, she writes the Chapman's in 1894. Uh, you know, as regards to my husband collecting any more coins, uh, he's often spoken about selling them. But it, it's a it's a lot of work, and you know, I don't really want him to buy any more coins because you know he doesn't have the money to. So of course, what happens? You, know, you keep reading the correspondence file, you see that Wetmore continues to buy coins. Um, and then uh, eventually uh, the Chapmans do sell his collection in 1906. All right, and then uh, David, could you could you also talk about some of the reorganization that was done as far as along with the Chapman uh, business paper scanning? Yes, I, I, this gets back to a little bit uh, how I mentioned how the Newman portal has so much uh, supported us in ways of doing projects that we couldn't really have undertaken on our own because for years, really, I tried to get those um, Chapman materials in some sort of order where they could be used. The, the letters themselves were all folded up into little, you know, uh, into envelopes. And when I first encountered them, they had already been worked on a little bit and put in some order. I then took them to kind of another level and put them in order a little bit. And then for a few years, I had a succession of interns coming in and we de I developed a method of taking these out of the envelopes and putting them into little folded uh, paper uh, folders. And I had all kinds of different interns working on this. In fact, at one point I had my own daughter in here and trying to fix these up. But it, this was such a slow and painstaking process that it um, took a couple of years and I had only, I'd barely done a box of these. And there were at that time close to 20 boxes. Um, now, Laura Jacobs, who you mentioned before is the person who does the scanning here, but she does so much more than just the scanning. Um, and she's extremely um, organized in the way that she uh, puts these things together. And so as part of this whole scanning process, the Newman portal funded her to uh, do this work that I had tried to get done for a couple of years of putting these in order because this really had to be done before they could be scanned anyway. Um, and Laura does such a great job of putting things, not only putting everything in order um, and presenting everything in such a clean way. Uh, she also, I, I tend to uh, write numerous articles for our magazine and she's always pointing out things of interest to me. So she's always got her eye open for that. So um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot more that goes on here than just the scanning. She's currently working on the, um, we've, we've been scanning the early correspondence of the ANS and she's been doing much the same work on those materials and keeping me alerted to all of the interesting things that she's finding in there. Um, so I'm really indebted to her in so many ways. Yeah, and so the, the, the Chapman uh, collection consists of several thousand pieces of correspondence, so it's, uh, it's a really rich archive. All right, uh, we've also uh, worked with the Garrett collection archives here. Uh, again, a uh, multi-generational collection. Uh, John Wart Garrett was uh, on the ANS board in the 1920s. Uh, the collection itself was left to Johns Hopkins and uh, ultimately disposed of by uh, Bowers and Ruddy. And in terms of the archival uh, material that we've uh, scanned are the, uh, the collection correspondence and the notebooks. Um, so here's just uh, an example page uh, showing an inventory of uh, territorial gold pieces. 
And uh, what I thought was interesting about this page was that, you know, it's not just the Garrett uh, collection, but he had made inquiries with other collectors and with the uh, National Numismatic Collection as well, um, you know, trying to figure out what all was out there. All right, and then uh, we're currently working on the ANS member correspondence. Uh, we started, uh, it starts in the 1850s, I, I forget exactly which year, um, but we'll be scanning that up through the 1930s. And uh, here's uh, just an example from uh, William Sumner Appleton Jr., uh, whose father, of course, was uh, closely associated with uh, Massachusetts Historical Society. And uh, Appleton says, um, you know, can you tell me who's publishing the American Journal of Numismatics? Uh, many years ago, it was gotten out by my father, who, if I remember, paid the entire cost and stood the losses for many years. Um, so to Appleton Sr., uh, we can be grateful for all the uh, 19th century uh, content in the American Journal of Numismatics, uh, which uh, for its time period was um, pretty much the uh, publication of reference. And uh, if you read further in this file, you actually learn that the Appleton collection wasn't given directly to Mass Historical Society, it was given by his estate. So that was a, a little tidbit uh, that I shared with Ann Bentley. She was, uh, she, she had not heard that. All right, um, so we have a new, I'm going to call it a new toy. It's not really a toy. It's a very sophisticated piece of equipment um, in St. Louis that uh, uh, Kim Dumas is going to talk about. So hi, everyone. I'm here today to present on the DT Titan, also known as the Shirley, um, in honor of Shirley K. Baker, a former dean within the university library system. So the digital transition Titan is the largest modern day copy stand for culture, cultural heritage materials. It was well known for it's well known for its capabilities of capturing quality images of materials that are typically oversized or challenging due to fragility, reflectiveness, and other irregularities found within special collections. It is um, often used for materials like maps, foldouts, and other uh, large oversized materials like artwork. By did not, uh, sorry, I can't talk this morning <laughs> or this afternoon. By design, um, it features a height customizable bench with a 40 by 60 inch uh, table surface. Also um, includes a motor powered DT auto column that automatically places the camera to desired PPI when entered using our Capture One software. Um, and a IXH 150 megapixel camera with a linear motor uh, for high precision focusing and um, an electronically controlled shutter. So today I wanted to uh, discuss our setup and show you guys um, an image of it. If you can see, um, it features two um, high powered photon uh, lights. Um, also in the back, uh, the tall column, DT auto powered column, um, you can't see it too well in this image just because the uh, black background, but um, also if uh, the camera is actually at its very top peak, because um, as you can see, there is a book that is getting ready to be shot, um, as well as the large copy stand. And um, if you see uh, to the right, there is a computer that uh, we are using to um, control the software and um, shoot the materials. So uh, using the Capture One, um, once again, uh, we use it to uh, type in the desired PPI. And what the camera will do is, um, depending on where we put it, it moves up and down um, electronically. Uh, the image for to the right um, is our digitization assistant. Kenneth Laster um, getting ready to shoot um, one of our special collections um, using our Shirley setup. All right, so um, I also wanted to show you guys um, a few images that were taken um, on this Shirley by um, our uh, digital imaging specialist, Mary Jane Cerruti, and then also um, I myself. So the image on the left, um, is an old map of St. Louis. And if you look at the image to the top right, 
um, it shows the map zoomed in, zoomed in because I wanted to you to show you guys the uh, detail um, within the map and how awesome the Shirley is as far as capturing um, these large oversized uh, materials. Um, what's fascinating about this photo is um, with older repographic technology, um, we would have had to shoot this image probably, I would say, about four times in four different spaces, and then using um, software like Adobe Photoshop, probably stitch it together because of its large size. And as you can see, it's a fold out from a book. And um, with the Shirley, we only had to digitize this um, particular uh, fold out one time without having to um, photo stitch anything. So um, it's cool because the actual camera itself, um, we can actually turn it to a different orientation in order to get the full image. Um, so I think that this is cool in terms of helping with productivity. So um, any large fold out, photo um, fold outs or anything that we have to shoot, um, the Shirley would be good technology for that. Um, also, I wanted to talk about the image to the right. This is something that um, I have shot myself. Um, it is from the uh, Iowa's Numismatics uh, scrapbooks. Um, I just digitized this item um, recently and a few other periodicals, and um, I thought it would be cool to um, show you all um, something um, in terms of numismatics that was shot using the Shirley. And we've got some more in the queue. We recently found in, in the Newman papers uh, some of uh, Jacob Perkins' patents from the UK, and they come with these large fold out drawings, which will be perfect for this. So we'll be um, digitizing those with this large format scanner. All right. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, copyright and uh, impacts on scanning. So uh, the current copyright law uh, protects materials for 95 years. So anything after 1927 is fair game. Uh, for many years, uh, the term was uh, up to 56 years. It was two 28-year terms. And uh, the length was extended through the lobbying of Disney and uh, other commercial publishers. Uh, anytime the Mickey Mouse character was uh, about to become uh, out of copyright, uh, they would uh, lobby Congress accordingly. So uh, in 1998, uh, something that has been uh, derisively referred to as the Mickey Mouse Protection Act uh, went through Congress. And uh, so today we have this 95-year uh, period. Um, however, uh, as I noted earlier, we've had uh, a lot of uh, organizations, you know, including ANS and many other numismatic organizations, uh, have given us permission to scan their materials. Um, so for that, uh, you know, with permission, uh, you know, uh, that, that takes care of the copyright issue. Um, for everything else, um, we will scan material on a restricted basis without full view, and we can uh, support search over that material. And uh, this was clarified uh, in Authors Guild versus Google in 2016, which basically uh, permits uh, scanning for uh, search purposes uh, over any material. So uh, we have scanned some material on that basis and uh, you know, we'll continue to do so. In many cases, we've scanned something on that basis and then uh, the copyright holder will come along later and uh, uh, you know, say, yeah, that's, that's fine. You can go ahead and open that up. Um, okay. yeah, so, we have a question on the large format uh, yes. scanner, so we're going to jump over to that. Hi, Richard. <laughs> so um, the preferred DPI that we shoot numismatic materials at is actually 400. We um, had did some trial and error test runs just to see which DPI would be the best. And for those types of materials, we normally shoot at 400. Um, it's very rare that we'll sit, shoot at 600. Um, the only person that does typically shoot at um, 600 DPI is our digital imaging specialist, Mary Jane Cerruti, just because um, we have some items that are from special collections that um, we want to capture as, most, um, as much detail as we can possible. Um, as far as the lights question goes, so 
Um, typically shooting numismatics materials, um, we will use du a dual lighting setup um, just because we want to make sure that um, we again are getting as much detail as possible in keeping the um, exposure um, adjustments at a um, very leveled and at a consistent level. So um, we usually use dual lighting. Um, again, it's very rare that we will use um, the term which we call raking light and you're only using one photon light rather than two is when we're shooting uh, like archives, um, archival materials and um, materials from special collections like rare books and um, manuscripts like that certain types of manuscripts. So I hope that answers your question, Richard. Uh, we have scanned some uh, numerous manual material with photographic plates, so we always uh, increase resolution in that case, but uh, for, you know, general print stuff, um, we're operating at the three or 400 level. Excuse me, can I uh, comment? Um, sure. One, I have found that um, I do uh, uh, die studies of uh, coins, which I often have to do from images, and uh, it really helps a great deal if one can... Um, enlarge the image uh, two or three times. And so I have found that uh, 600 uh, is a little, a little, a little better. So uh, uh, of course, I, this is just a suggestion, but uh, if you do uh, scan any of the auction catalogs uh, in the ANS's collect collection, uh, it would be nice if they were done at 600, if that doesn't take up too much time. Sure. Yeah, and, and of course, you know, the other challenge with auction catalogs is that uh, a lot of the mid 20th century stuff is all half tones and uh, you can enlarge it as much as you want. It won't help. But uh, for, for the material with photographic plates, um, it's, it's yeah, it's very helpful. OK, uh, I want to talk a little bit about Coin World and Numismatic News. Um, uh, ANS and NNP originally shared the cost of uh, scanning uh, Coin World. Uh, this was done back in uh, 2017, 2018, 3,000 issues. Um, and then uh, subsequent to that, uh, we also scanned Numismatic News. And uh, actually, one of the things we're doing at ANS today is pulling a, a few gaps in the collection um, that, we, that we hadn't previously scanned. Um, these are not open. These are not open access. Um, and since they're you know, still owned by commercial publishers um, who wish to uh, maintain uh, control over that. Um, so, but we do make them available for search and we can uh, share articles on a fair use basis. We're not gonna give somebody a whole issue or if you ask for a hundred articles, you probably won't get that. But if you have one article you want and you have a citation for it, we'll, we'll go grab it and, and send you, send you a, a copy. Um, and the uh, Coin World reference set that was scanned, uh, you can just uh, kind of see the enormity of the, the situation there on the right. And I'm not sure that's even all of it, but um, in, in any case, um, there's just a tremendous amount of really good material in these publications. So we were, you know, it was just something uh, we needed to do uh, for these publications of record. Okay, and then uh, in terms of future scanning possibilities, and uh, I have not discussed this list, list with David, so it may be a surprise. Um, uh, and these are some things that either I've noticed or people have, have mentioned that said, you know, can, you know, could you could could you do that, or this might be interesting. So uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, large scent uh, correspondence. Um, the uh, Mickley Diaries from the 19th century here. We've never scanned them. Uh, these were published by uh, Joel Oros in uh, uh, American Journal of Numismatics uh, probably about 15 years ago. Uh, really rich archive. The Baldwin's auction sale catalogs. I really want to do these because um, the auction house has given us permission to do these and uh, present them with full view. Um, so it's an extensive series. So uh, that would be great to have. Um, we know there's a box of 19th century counterfeit detectors here. Um, this is special to us because uh, we scanned a lot of the counterfeit detectors from the Newman collection, which was a topic that he was very interested in. Um, so it would be it would be great to add the ANS uh, group at some point. 
Um, I got a request uh, a couple months ago for uh, Batty's uh, 19th century catalog. And uh, this is one of these resources you would have assumed that, that Google Books had done. And they had done a couple volumes, but they hadn't done the whole thing. And there are these old black and white scans. So, you know, uh, we really should just scan the whole series in, in color. Um, so that's a resource that should be added. Uh, the Damon Douglas papers are here as well. We have not scanned those. Um, and uh, I could go on a lot further, but these were just some of the, the top items on the list. Um, we got a question here uh, from Bob Hogue. Will NNP eventually scan the entire ANS photo card file archive of items from past auctions? Um, so I'm trying to even think with that is I know we had these library catalogs in the early 1960s that had the photo card file, but I'm not exactly sure if that's what he's referring to. Uh, David, do, do you know? Yeah, he's talking, I think, I think we're talking about the photo file here, um, that at some point there was an idea that we could um, get those digitized um, to present a lot of complex, I'm sorry, okay. Uh, issues having to do with the photos themselves, um, tend to sometimes fall off of the cards. And um, this is kind of a massive, uh, sometimes, you know, when, when we give them uh, to somebody to use, we give them a glue stick to use along with them. Um, because, you know, once these photos fall off and they're just in the bottom of the drawer, they're not worth anything to anybody. Um, this is a massive set of, um, of card uh, photo file that was started in 1915 uh, by Agnes Baldwin. And um, it's really an incredible set and gets used all the time. I had somebody in here this week just using those materials. Um, but that would be quite an undertaking. So that, that, that's, a good, that's a good target. And there's a similar photo card file uh, at Harlan Burke in Chicago that was originally uh, from uh, the Shulman family. Um, and that one is on the order of like, 50,000 cards, it may even be in the hundreds of thousands, but it, it's, a, it's a huge number. And I think it's similar to what, what the ANS has. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that, that sounds like a, definitely a worthy target. Uh, George Kuhay writes, um, I may have found one of the numismatic news missing volumes. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, Jan Monroe says, uh, has Coins Magazine been scanned? We have scanned most of Coins Magazine. Um, it is not open access. I believe that was a Krauss publication. Um, but yes, we have scanned, uh, I, I don't know if it's all of them, but I know we've done a, a pretty substantial portion of, uh, of that from, from St. Louis. Okay. All right, so we'll uh, open it up for any other questions uh, at this point. I believe that's the last slide, yeah. I, have, I, have as I, I noted, as I noted earlier, we've been uh, uh, a polling from the ANS collection here, uh, a number of loose issues of uh, Coin News or Coin World and Numismatic News. Uh, the, some of those are large formats. So we'll be doing those in St. Louis, um, but uh, we appreciate the opportunity to fill in uh, some of the gaps in, in the collection with those issues. All right. Um, all right. There's a question on the. Coin World publications, does this include coin values, paper money values? Um, yes, I don't know that we have complete sets of all of those, um, but I know we have pretty substantial runs of all of those titles. If one looks up an item on the ANS library uh, website, how can one tell if it's been scanned? So uh, the easiest way is just go to the, the, the Donum, the ANS library catalog online. And if it has been scanned, there will be a, uh, just a line in, in the item description that says a link to Internet Archive or something like that. Um, and then you can go to the uh, images directly. Um, I believe, now that, that's true for all, all the library materials. Now, 
I believe that's less true for the archival materials. Um, David can probably speak better to that than I can, because um, the uh, Archer database is, is uh, a little bit different from Donum. Um, I believe, for example, if you looked at the Virgil Grand archives in Archer, there probably would be links to the digitized copies. David will know for sure. Um, well, Archer doesn't allow linking, actually. So okay. uh, I believe in the case of Brand, because you have these distinct um, ledgers, it's possible that certain or some of the ledgers are linked. I mean, the problem with the archival materials is that we're doing them uh, as individual items. So you would have many, many thousands of items uh, relating to one record. So you could never, I mean, sometimes uh, the most, maybe we'll have five copies of an auction catalog. So you'll find five different links in a record, but um, the archival materials, this is what causes the most problem. You really can't have uh, the links like that. So, but certainly for the auction sale catalogs and uh, some of the other materials, the, the links will all be there. Um, so I know we, we've uh, scanned 12,000 items here, and I believe we have uh, 8,000 of them are linked through the library catalog. So, um, all right, next question. Uh, how do we access the NMP material, NMP material that is online? Um, it's newmanportal.org. And uh, if you click on library at, at, at the top bar there, it'll uh, drill you down to the auction sale catalogs and the periodicals um, and, and the reference books. So uh, it, it's actually a Washington University website, but uh, newmanportal.org will, will take you there. How does one make a request for certain uh, catalogs to be scanned in the ANS library? Sure. Um, yeah, on the front page, uh, newmanportal.org, there is, a, or nmp.wustl.edu, uh, there is a contact the curator. I think it's toward the bottom of the page, but um, you can click on that and uh, that'll generate uh, an email to me. So, and we do maintain spreadsheets of, uh, of requests and items in the queue. So we uh, definitely take those under advisement. Mr. Warner, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Len, thank you um, for scanning um, the records of the Pacific Coast Numismatic Society and uh, some of the other token journals that I sent. I'm working on some other groups to try to uh, uh, get that, that material as well. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is some of the more recent uh, uh, publications of these token organizations and others are already electronic. Mm -hmm. um, what would be the best way to, to uh, so you didn't, we didn't have to scan those if they're already right. PDFs. Um, what would be the best way to, uh, to get those to you? Sure, yeah, just um, mail me the PDFs. Um, what a lot of organizations do is they just have me on their mailing list. And so whenever they put out a PDF, I get, I get one and, and add it to NMP so we can do that. Or if you have a bunch of old ones, we can set up a Dropbox or some other way to transfer those files. Um, but yeah, the, the more and more we're adding to our collection through um, PDFs um, since um, virtually every publication today is, is born digital. So uh, that's uh, just the, the easiest great, way to great. do it. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll be in touch. Um, my second question is about searching. Um, I've had some success with the advanced search option. Um, but I'm a computer scientist, and so you know I'm not unfamiliar with these kinds of things. Um, many of my colleagues are not, and and have had a lot of difficulty. Sure. Um, do you have any plans to to um, to simplify the searching process? Um, yeah, we're we're in the middle of replacing our whole back end, um, so the, the, this will. Uh, this will change um, when that happens. Um, and there are other ways even today of uh, searching the repository directly uh, that uh, can get you a little bit more capability than what you get on the uh, new and portal site itself. Um, but the uh, best thing to do is just uh, contact me uh, directly through the, the front page and I can uh, okay, help thanks. out with any, um, any so, Some kind of how to, um, <laughs> page would would might help um yeah there there is a an faq on there for search um we probably need to highlight it better because 
Uh, a few people have asked for that. Um, it is there, but um, maybe not really uh, quite clear how to get there from the front page. Well, thank you again for, for doing the, the PCNS papers. That really was a big deal for us. Thank, thank you. you. I think that Internet Archive um, has better searching capabilities, and yeah. most of the materials we also add to in, um, Internet Archive as well. Right. So you might have better luck, um, you know, using the search function yep. there as well. Mm -hmm. I, I have a kind of a question. Um, so there's is it's always very exciting to hear the different kind of fruits of these projects. Are you collecting anecdotes? I mean, I know I see articles all the time in the ANS Magazine on our blog, Pocket Change on the eighth, on the Asylum and the East Asylum they're, where they're clearly drawing on Newman Numismatic Portal um, data. So do you, are you collecting little you know, anecdotes of kind of the fruits of these projects at all? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, we, uh, we have a annual review with our sponsor and definitely uh, go through some of those stories uh, uh, with him. So yeah, um, it's there, there are a lot of needles in haystacks. Um, I was uh, working with uh, Joel Oros just last week and he was doing some work on the 19th century dealer, uh, uh, Daniel Guru, or I think Daniel is the first name. Um, and, you know, he, he, just by typing that name in a Newman, Newman portal, he comes up with, you know, a bunch of citations that he, he never could have found on, on, on his own or, you know, unless he went to a lot of work. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's becoming much more of an indispensable resource for uh, this kind of research. Cool, thank you. You want to relay your comment to our speakers, or yeah? So uh, just uh, a comment from Chuck Heck, uh, noting that he was able to find uh, a coin from an auction catalog and actually identify the die state, which is. Uh, Given a lot of the images in, 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 the, in the auction catalogs, that's, uh, that's noteworthy. So that's great. Which auction catalog? Um, Chuck, do you remember which uh, auction catalog it was? Uh, yes, it was. Uh, I don't remember the auctioneer, but it was the Augustus Kreit Collection, K R I T E. <clears throat> Excuse my, my throat. Uh, and I had never heard of that before. And uh, Len, you saved the day, buddy. <laughs> nice. I, I never heard of the Craig Collection either. You know, when we started this project, I knew everything that was on there. You know, I, I knew what it was, but it's uh, the size of the collection is uh, uh, long it exceeded my ability to remember what's on there. So sometimes I'll look for something and be surprised it's there, but it is. So um, that's, so that's what happens when you, you scan for seven years. Your personal storage file got full, is that right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that was a real help, believe me, a real help. Excellent. Yeah, and then, you know, when, you know, we have uh, great researchers like, like Chuck who, you know, put out these really nice publications uh, uh, based on some of the work we've done, that, uh, that's really fulfilling. So appreciate that. Thank you, too. Thank you. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.